Hello, and welcome to day one of Sentry's launch week. My name is Indraji, and I'm the director of engineering for our performance product. Performance monitoring tools often provide endless ways to visualize a firehose of data, but a common problem I run into is how I can tie all of this data back to my application code. Today, I'm going to show you how Sentry solves this problem by getting you as close as possible to the code causing your browser, mobile, and backend apps to perform poorly. We're launching two new products that help you connect performance problems to code. The first is Web Vitals, which uses industry standard metrics to measure the quality of a user's experience with your web pages. The second is function regression issues, which automatically detect when functions in your app or service have gotten slower. We all know that performance is key to delivering a product that your users want to use, and more satisfied users lead to better business outcomes. I think at this point, we've all seen the studies. Even marginal improvements to performance can lead to meaningful differences for our business. But optimizing the experience your end users have isn't easy because it requires making changes across apps and services. Poor front-end performance is most often caused by poor back-end performance, like when an API endpoint has high latency. But in some cases, the front-end can be responsible too, like when you have poorly optimized UI code. Most tools are focused on one part of the problem, either the front-end or the back-end. But solving performance problems requires understanding both. Tracing allows us to connect what's happening on your browser or mobile front end to the back end code that is responsible for handling the API requests. This visibility across the entire stack is essential to being able to solve performance problems holistically. However, tracing alone is not the solution to every problem. It doesn't go deep enough to tell you where an app or service is burning CPU cycles. Profiling allows us to collect information about the code that is running within an app or service and visualize the hot paths that are consuming the most CPU cycles. Profiling has been a part of the Sentry feature set on backend and mobile platforms for a while now, but now we're excited to launch support for collecting browser JavaScript profiles in beta. It's an incredibly powerful tool. It gets you granular function level performance data, but it's often too complex and information dense to use as a starting point without first understanding the larger problem you're trying to solve. Only by combining these technologies can we enable all developers, regardless of experience level, to maintain great performance end to end. In this first demo, we'll show you how to use Web Vitals to find the slowest pages in your application and how to improve those pages using tracing and profiling. We'll drill down from performance scores to traces to the code responsible for performance bottlenecks. Let's get to it. Here's our new Web Vitals product. What I'm showing you here is real Web Vitals data collected from our own Sentry front-end web app. On the top left here, you see the Sentry performance score, which is a score out of 100 that represents the overall performance of your application. The score is calculated by weighting the values of these individual Web Vital metrics. If you're familiar with Lighthouse and Lighthouse scores, you might know that the Lighthouse score is calculated by measuring the performance of your app in a lab environment. This performance score is not a Lighthouse score, but it is calculated in a similar way, except using production data from real users using your application on their own web browsers. On the right here, you see a breakdown of the score into components, and you can see how each of these components changes over time. Below that, you have a summary of all of these web vitals, LCP, FCP, FID, CLS, and TTFB. And you can see here that for Sentry, two of these vitals have a good score, and three of them have a poor score. In order to improve our web vital scores, and in turn, improve our overall performance score, we have to improve the performance of individual pages. Here we see a list of the pages in the app alongside their web vital scores and the performance score of each page. We also have this opportunity column on the right, which represents the biggest opportunities to improve your overall performance score. You can see here that this first page with an opportunity score of 11.43 offers the biggest opportunity for us to improve our application's overall performance score. So let's take a look at this page and see what we can do to improve its performance. This page shows an overview of the performance of the page that we selected and now these performance score widgets show performance score of this page and not the overall application. We can see right away here that this page has a poor LCP score, which means that the user might wait a long time for this page to finish loading. Underneath that, we have a list of individual page load events. These represent real users loading this page in production. For each event, we show the web vitals and we show the performance score for that page load. In this first example, this user had an LCP of 10.4 seconds, which means that they spent a really long time waiting for this page to load. And we can see that reflected here in the performance score, which is a very poor score of nine. Let's dig into a more detailed breakdown of the page load event. Here we see the spans, which are the operations that occurred during the page load, 
that may contribute to the 10 second LCP. In this list of spans, LCP is marked here using this red line. The spans that come before LCP are LCP blocking. The spans that come after LCP are not LCP blocking, which means that the biggest optimization opportunities for improving LCP are in the spans that come before this line. If I scroll down here, one thing that stands out to me immediately is that this span, which measures how long it takes to load the JavaScript bundle, is taking around six seconds. If I keep scrolling, I see all of these other resource load spans that are executing in parallel. And if I click into one of them, I can see that it's loading a chunk of the JavaScript bundle. So all of these parallel spans are JS bundle loading, and you can see that it all happens before LCP. So from this, I could say that this application is probably loading a lot of JavaScript, and if we reduce the size of the JavaScript bundle, we would improve LCP. Now, continuing on, I see that these other spans, these long task spans, are emitted when the browser is running some JavaScript code that's blocking the UI thread. And in this case, it's blocking LCP. In particular, I see this long task span that takes almost one second. If I click into this, I can see that we have a profile associated with this here. And if I want to understand what's happening during this long task span, I can just go and look at the profile. So let's do that. So here I'm looking at a profile that was captured from the user's browser in production during this page load. And down here, I can see that it came from a Chromium-based browser running on an Android device. This profile provides us a lot of insight into the JavaScript code that was running in the browser during this 988 millisecond long task span. For those unfamiliar with profiling or flame graphs, I'll give a brief overview. The x-axis here represents time, and the y-axis represents the call stack. The root function frames are here at the top, and if I scroll down, the leaf function frames are here at the bottom. Now going back to this long task span, if I focus on the profiling data collected alongside this span, there's a function that stands out. And that's this eCharts-react-core.prototype.componented-mount function. It takes 558 milliseconds, which is a significant proportion of the overall 988 milliseconds spent on this span. If I go back in time a bit here, I can see that we've rendered other React components, but none of them take quite as much time as this specific component. So from this, I can see that another opportunity to optimize LCP is to focus on this specific React component. And so to recap, we walked through how to debug a performance problem in a browser app, all the way from high-level performance scores down to the code that was responsible. And we found two opportunities for improving LCP, reducing our bundle size and optimizing this eCharts component. Web Vitals are available to Sentry customers today. Fixing slow performance is one problem, but sustaining great performance is another. We'll show you how to use function regression issues to debug a backend regression and connect it to the line of code causing the problem. This is an example of a function regression issue that was caused by a real regression in Sentry's backend. We can see this function, redis rate limiter is limited with value, had about a 50% increase in P95 duration. In the duration chart below, you can see where we think the regression occurred, along with how the function was performing before and after the regression. You can see here there's a pretty clear change in P95 duration right around this time. If we look at the throughput chart below, we see a clear correlation. The throughput after the regression was higher than the throughput before the regression. This suggests that increased load might be one of the causes of this regression. Below this, you can see a list of API endpoints that were impacted by this regression. That means that all of these endpoints somehow end up calling through to Redis rate limiter dot is limited with value, which means that their durations are impacted as well. In this first endpoint, you can see that its P95 duration has regressed from 330 milliseconds to 458 milliseconds as a result of this function regressing. Next, we have sample profiles that were captured before and after the regression. We can compare these profiles to understand what changed and what caused the regression. So let's do that. I'm going to open up an example of a profile that was collected before the regression. Here you can see the regress function is highlighted and it's called twice. The first call takes about 300 milliseconds and the second call takes about one second. Above the functions, you can see from the span data the Redis operations that were executed in order for these functions to be called. Now, taking a closer look at the leaf functions that this function calls into, we see two notable functions. The first one is connectionpool.getConnection, and the second one is connectionpool.release. You can see that both of these functions are called both times that Redis rate limiter dot is limited with value is called. Going back to the issue page, I'm going to open up an example of a profile that was collected after the regression so we can compare. 
you can see here the same regress function is highlighted, except this time it takes 2.8 seconds, which is significantly longer than it took before the regression. We can also see one of the same leaf functions, connection pool .get connection. And if I scroll to the right a bit here, I can see the second leaf function as well, connection pool .release. However, this one takes 11 milliseconds, so it's likely not relevant to the regression. Now, focusing back on this leaf function, we can see here that it takes 2.79 seconds, which again is much longer than it took before the regression. So from this, we can infer that this function has something to do with why this regressed. From the source annotation here, you can see where this function is defined, which is in the Redis module inside connection.py on line 1177. So for convenience, I've opened up that source code here. Here, that exact line of code is highlighted, and this code attempts to acquire a lock. From this, we can infer that there are multiple tasks trying to acquire this lock at the same time, leading to lock contention. And then this lock contention is the reason for our regression. And it would make sense that higher throughput would increase the chances of lock contention. So in this example, we saw how we can go from just a function regression issue, and with a little digging, we can find the code that is responsible for the regression. Function regression issues are available to early adopters today and will be generally available over the next two weeks. Even though our demo focused on the backend, this capability is supported across all of our platforms, including browser and mobile. In addition to these features, we're continuing to solve more problems for browser, mobile, and backend developers, and I'd like to give you an early preview of what's to come. Earlier in the Web Vitals demo, I pointed out some slow resource loads caused by a large JavaScript bundle. We'll soon be able to give you detailed information on both which resource loads are largest or take the longest to load, and a breakdown of the JS bundle, so you can see which code actually gets used on initial page load and which code can be deferred until later. We didn't talk much about mobile today, but we're committed to making Sentry a first-class experience for mobile developers, and we're rebuilding this experience from the ground up. We're focusing on the things that matter most to mobile developers, app startup, frame drops, and screen load performance, and designing workflows that not only show you the metrics, but get you to the code causing these problems. Now, let's talk about the backend. I demoed the function regression issue, but we're not done with making regressions more actionable. We're introducing another issue type, endpoint regression, which tracks regressions at an API endpoint level rather than a function level. It provides more high-level context with span-based data on what caused the performance of an API endpoint to regress. As a reminder, we'll have a live Q&A in Discord for the next hour, and be sure to check out the blog post accompanying this video for more details on all the features I talked about today. Make sure to tune in tomorrow for day two of launch week where Jasmine and Michelle will be sharing what's new with Session Replay. Thanks for watching. Thank you for joining us. Now you have seen where we're taking the performance product, but we're not stopping there. We've heard your feedback. We know that custom metrics are important to you and we're adding it. I'm very excited to show you what we're cooking up. This is a very early glimpse of what's going to come later down the year but we are already very excited to get your feedback to understand if we're going down the right path. In short, we're adding custom metrics so you can plot them and you can alert on them and you can then dive deeper and find out exactly why they are looking like they are. So how does it work? You measure what's important to you, be it business metrics, be it component metrics, anything that's important to you, you can measure. We are then correlating those metrics against traces and replays so you can dive deeper into what exactly is going wrong. Additionally, this is a developer-first de uh, metrics product, which means that we, for instance, also record things like code locations so you understand where the metrics are coming from. Here's an example of how you can use this product. You might have a login component and a login service, and you're interested in how to monitor it. On the front end, you might want to record how many times the login component comes up and from which source. On the back end, you might be interested in understanding how long it takes to load for the different kind of providers and to complete the login process. No matter where you record on mobile, front end, or back end, it all can go to the same place, which means you have a pretty good overview of what's going on. You can then plot these. In this case, we're looking at the back end login attempt metric, and we can see overall that that Google sign in is the most uh, common form of signing into the service. However, we can also look at the tail latencies. In this case, we can see that the P99 uh, is dominated by the custom sample sign-in. And here, as we narrow down on a specific time frame and on one of those higher latencies, we can see that there are example traces that can surface the customers that might be impacted by this. And this could either tell us that the customer has, in this case, a slowly configured sample server and it might be time to reach out to them, or we can figure out if there's something wrong on the side of us 
Um, and because you have all the spans and everything that helps you drill down into this problem, you have a much better understanding of what's going on. We're very excited about where we are taking this, but we also want your feedback and we want to engage with you. Please join our Q&A and we'll continue also the conversation on GitHub.